coal mines for beehives. Welcome back to Good News Next Week, everybody. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com with episode 56 of some of the ways that we are winning and solutions-oriented stories. And we begin where I began, back in West Virginia, as our first story has displaced West Virginia coal miners turning to beekeeping. This via EcoWatch, who reports Mark Lilly, and it seemed funny, Lilly is such a common name that I know from growing up in West Virginia. However, this guy, Mark Lilly, is a retired insurance adjuster and a longtime beekeeper in West Virginia, seeing beekeeping as a way for longtime Appalachians to preserve their connection to the land and earn extra money during lean times, whether or not coal is over or isn't. Some might even be able to support themselves and their families on bee income. Coming up in January of 2018, Lily's going to teach 35 people from southern West Virginia, and that's exactly where I was born and raised, how to raise and manage bees and how to produce honey. Appalachian Headwaters plans to expand that number to 85 in the following year, which is in conjunction with something called the Appalachian Beekeeping Collective, Planning to process, market, and distribute honey, Ultima goal is to bring millions of dollars into the region and provide income for hundreds of Appalachians. The new beekeepers will receive hives either for free or at a reduced price depending on their income. The eventual goal is to have thousands of hives flourishing in the area. Yeah, there's a lot of think tanks and nonprofits and NGOs involved in this story and many of the stories like it. It's the same multinational corporations profiting off of the new green rush, but... Right, Frank? Much like cannabis or home gardens or any other kind of homestead action, you don't need centralized control. You just plant your victory garden, or in this case, maybe your victory beehives, and the honey will flow. Let's see if we can keep Frank in the shot. And that's really, I mean, that's the dream for my home state of West Virginia. And I got to visit there last week visit family and friends and it's a part of what's called bridge day which goes on in my hometown and you can find links and more about that in the links over at mediamonarchy.com one of the best parts and this should be its its own its own story in and of itself i i saw a friend from high school who's quit her health scare job to run a soap company with her husband. A huge shout out and congrats to my friend Mary and Wild Mountain Soaps. So we'll include links to that and we'll include links to all the other stories that we mention here on Good News Next Week, just like we link up everything we say and play on all the Media Monarchy episodes. Our next story was tweeted using hashtag Good News Next Week from our friend at Entheogenesis. Agrihoods replacing golf communities. This via Business Insider, who say millennials are saying so long to the country club and hello to the farm. Many so called agrihoods, short for agricultural neighborhoods, cropping up all around the U.S. and they're aimed at farm to table loving millennials. Loosely defined by the Urban Land Institute as master planned housing communities with working farms as their focus, agrihoods have ample green space, barns, outdoor community kitchens. Some have greenhouses and rows and rows of fruit trees. The homes are typically built to high environmental standards, solar panels, composting, and all that stuff. Agrihoods are designed to appeal to young, active families who love to eat healthy and spend time outdoors, and they're not off the grid. In fact, there are about 150 agrihoods across the country, according to the ULI, Urban Land Institute, and some are minutes away from bustling metropoli like Atlanta, Phoenix, and Fort Collins in Colorado. That they don't have to trade in the city for sustainable living is most likely a big attractor for millennials who represent the largest segment of American home buyers today. Paul Habibi, professor of real estate at UCLA's Anderson School, told the OC Register behind the orange curtain that agrihoods represented a confluence of economic profits, environmental good, and social benefit, an especially attractive offer to millennials. So this highly skewed and doofily written article from Business Insider wants us to think, oh, it's just those millennials. I don't know if that's some positive PR for them, but ultimately this is about anyone who likes those things and it really can defy demographics ultimately it would bring demographics together instead of all the divisions of oh young black white young old millennial old boomer and all these things again it's always you know divide and conquer divide and conquer this story much like i, I think most of our stories on good news next week and i've joked before in the past that each episode of good news next week should probably require hell you, you should do this 
a whole rebuttal episode of why these things aren't, as we've long joked on New World next week, hashtag not unmitigated good, because there are lots of ways that you can poke lots of holes in these stories, but ultimately it's not about the stories as much as it's about the ideas, and that's the power of all of it, as I often say. It's not about Napster, or not about Blockbuster, or Netflix, or Uber, any of that. It's about doing it yourself. Our friend Nathan in the land down under hits me up with all kinds of stories. Let's grab one from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. As again, this is just the idea. No one place has the monopoly on this. You can do these anywhere. Repair cafes aim to reduce waste by teaching people how to make do and mend. Remember what they say in Brave New World. Ending is better than mending. In a culture where make, do, and mend has been replaced by the impulse to throw away, a popular new concept is encouraging people to repair their broken possessions. Repair cafes not only reduce the volume of waste going to a landfill, they also build community. Movement began in Amsterdam, and again, I don't know, can they lay claim to exactly owning that sort of thing? It's, we've got, you know, tool libraries even here in Portland. And we've talked about community fridges and little free libraries and again all these sort of decentralized sharing community based ideas the entirety of these 56 episodes of good news next week so again i don't even really have to read the rest of that article because ultimately it is the idea and again the links will be included so you can go learn more about that because you might be in a spot where you need or want to set up a repair cafe or you might be a beekeeper any of those numbers of things, again, I, I guess I've always seen my role as sort of laying out ideas and breadcrumbs and bits and pieces, and you can go grab upon those and hopefully take those and, and build better things. The other two Good News Next Week stories are actually pretty creepy dark ones, so it's perfect that we're a few hours away from Halloween. West Coast Jurisdictions Advanced Community Oversight of Police Surveillance. This via our good friend Morgan Lesko at Wiki World Order and originally via EFF. This summer they note that Seattle and L.A took big steps to curtail surveillance as more and more open source bits of police abuse and, and ultimately police state going checked not unchecked. The other story is via our friend Dan Dix at Press for Truth writing on Steemit. The CIA conducted experiments in Canada as part of their MK Ultra program, where of course human beings were repatterned by the evil Dr. Ewan Cameron at Montreal's Allen Memorial Institute, where he kept his subjects in a chemically induced sleep for weeks and subjected them to rounds of electroshocks, experimental drugs, and tape-recorded messages played over and over and over. The federal government ended up reaching an out-of-court settlement with a family member of one of the victims earlier this year, paying her $100,000 in exchange for dropping the legal action she launched back in only September of 2015. $100,000 ain't a lot for ruined lives, as, of course, the powers that shouldn't be have a lot more settlements. But in a lot of ways, I guess that's extra positive because it puts on the record that they've admitted it and they know it. And those are the best arguments to bring to the table whenever you're kind of having these discussions with your family or friends or community. We've been exposing fake news for a long, long time. I had a fun time actually showing a couple of those articles to my dad and a couple other people as I was back east last week. Hey, look, here's on my website from 2007. FEMA apologizes for fake news conference. Comcast, sorry, for fake news announcements. It's all on MediaMonarchy.com, and we've been doing it for 12-plus years and running. Now, about two years ago, I quit my commercial FM radio job because I wanted to go crowdsourced, and so far, so good. I love doing it, and I really can't see doing anything else, ultimately. I like doing radio. I like sharing ideas, playing music, playing records, arguing about stuff, and being excited and enthusiastic and not sort of angry and sort of fear-based and driven or divisive. I guess I a long time have also felt like, oh, my numbers should be so much better, but I don't really deal in all the divisive, all caps lot kind of crap. So we'll keep slugging it out and slow and steady wins the race, like I said on one of my shows this morning, as we are essentially broadcasting live Monday through Friday at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. And said, hey, we're, we're slow and steady wins the race. You saw they did that actual tortoise versus the hare race with real animals just the other day. Guess who won? Freaking tortoise. We're the tortoise, and we're going to continue to win that kind of way. You can always submit 
good news stories and some of the ways that we are running using hashtag good news next week. And a special shout out to my buddy Tyler who wrote out to say, hey man, why haven't you done a good news next week episode? And he echoes the sentiments that a lot of other people say, man, this is an important show. We need some kind of positivity. And the honesty part is it's hard to put together good news sometimes. Not a lot of times you feel like, oh, there's a bunch of great good news. But there is great good news, and we can find it, and we can share it, and again, work together. MediaMonarchy.com slash support keeps us all going and growing, moving and grooving, my friends. So that's episode 56 of Good News next week for October 30th, 2017. On behalf of Frankie here, I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, reminding you as always, like Jellyby Offer says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.